Hi friends. I want to welcome you to our new Bible study titled, It's All About Jesus. And today, today's lesson is going to be Jesus, Our Example. And I begin with a story just to get us into the flow of thinking about Jesus as our example. This comes from the uh, history of the Vietnam War, where at the age of 23, a, a second lieutenant named Carl Marlantes was in charge of 40 Marines during an intense battle in the Vietnam War. Marlantes moved his men into the jungle as they waited for U.S. jets to bomb a hill that the North Vietnamese had overtaken. Now, unfortunately, the jets came, but they dropped their bombs on the wrong hill. And so when Marlantes led his men out of the jungle, they were instantly under fire from relatively untouched machine gun positions. Now, Marlantes knew it would only take a few minutes before the enemy rockets and, and mortars would find his troops. And he recorded that the entire mission actually ground to a halt as U.S. soldiers, really actually Marines, ducked behind downed trees and they huddled in shell holes. Well, Lieutenant Marlantes, he reports he knew what he had to do next. And here's how he records what he did. Quote, if I didn't get up and lead, we'd get wiped out. I did a lot of things that day, but the one I'm most proud of is that I simply stood up in the midst of the flying metal and I started to run up the hill. In fact, he goes on to say, he goes, I simply ran forward up the steep hill, zigzagging for the bunker and the enemy positions all by myself, hoping that my own Marines wouldn't hit me in the back it's hard to zigzag while running uphill loaded down with ammunition and grenades, he reports. But as he goes on to tell the story, he says, in the midst of this kind of solo charge up the hill to take out the enemy, Lieutenant Marlantes suddenly saw some movement in his peripheral vision. And here's what he writes. He says, it was a Marine. He said, I saw him and he was about 15 meters below me, zigzagging, falling, up and running again, moving in my general direction. And then I noticed immediately behind him, a long ragged line of Marines were coming and moving and weaving up the hill behind me. Behind the line were spots of crumpled bodies lying where they'd been hit. They'd all come with me. It turns out everyone was intermingled and they were weaving and rushing and covering, taking on each hole and bunker one at a time in groups. And it became we, we the group, he writes, just rushing forward all at once. And we, we couldn't be stopped. In fact, just individuals amongst us were stopped, but we couldn't be. And then he concludes by writing, I was we, but no longer me. Well, I share that story to begin with because I'm reminded as I listen to the story of Lieutenant Marlantes that as Christians, we are called to follow Jesus in every way, even when that way may not be the easy way. In fact, you could say that that is what really being a disciple of Jesus Christ is all about. I'm thinking here of the words of 1 Peter 2 verse 21 where it says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Well, in the lesson, we're thinking about Jesus, our example. And what I'd like to do together in this lesson is Look at a few examples that Jesus set for us that he really does want us to follow. Now, the first example that he left for us that he does expect we'll follow is we need to follow Jesus in loving others. In loving, that's what we're to follow as an example. And you know, this is no surprise to us because, frankly, if Jesus is known for anything, it is for his love. In fact, even the non-Christian world recognizes this fact. Now, while sometimes they might misinterpret what his love was really all about, they still recognize this as what is often thought of as the central quality of being Christ-like, the very central core of Jesus's presence here on earth. 
In fact, who can deny that one who came from heaven and voluntarily offered his life for ours as a sacrifice is one who understands love for others at a level none of the rest of us can comprehend. And yet Jesus is the one that calls all Christians to demonstrate the same level of love for each other. In fact, he said in John chapter 13, verse 34, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Now this verse in John is a very important one because it contains the love commandment. And I want you to notice three things about this verse. The first is, Jesus, well, let's be frank, Jesus isn't asking us to do this. He actually commands his disciples, imploring us that we must do this. The second thing we notice in this verse is the command to love one another. Well, it's repeated for emphasis. That means it's very important. The third thing that we notice in this verse is the love we are to show one another is to be the same as the love Jesus has demonstrated towards us. He says, just as I have loved you. That's the way in which we are to love others. And you know, as we think about that, we're called to love others just as Jesus loves us. We realize that is a level of love that calls for personal sacrifice for putting the other person first, and even living a life focused on love at all times. In other words, this isn't going to happen by accident, beloved. It is something that must be personally emphasized and, of course, personally embraced. Listen again to John 13, verse 35, where Jesus says this. He says, By this, that is love, by this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. In other words, Jesus follows up his command by explaining the purpose of it. He not only wants us to follow his example, he wants us to do it precisely as a demonstration to the world that we are his followers. And of course, people who truly follow Jesus, well, they act like Jesus does, don't they? It is impossible to be a true disciple of Christ, yet at the same time live a life that does not resemble his life. Now, we're not talking about perfection here, but what we are talking about is a kind of constant attempt to live and to think and act like our master. So we must follow Jesus in loving. But you know, there's another example we must follow. We must follow, secondly, Jesus in welcoming, in welcoming. You know, we often focus on how we need to be welcoming to those outside the fellowship of Christ. And of course, that's a very good thing. In fact, the Bible stresses that in our outreach to those who don't know Christ, we need to be inviting, we need to be courteous, we need to treat them as we would want to be treated. But did you know we are also to be welcoming to those who are already in the household of faith, that is, people who belong to God? Paul makes this point in Romans 15, verse 7. He says, Therefore, welcome one another, as Christ has welcomed you, for the glory of God. Now again, here we see the concept of following Christ's example. How are we to welcome each other? The text says, as Christ has welcomed you. And of course, this raises the question, how has Christ welcomed us? The answer is, Christ has welcomed us with open arms. He has taken us in no matter what condition we happen to be in when he met us. He has forgiven, he has embraced us, and made us to be an integral part of his family. And so the question is, can we do any less for our brothers and our sisters in Christ? I want you to listen to this passage from the Gospel of Matthew and think about what we are called to do in being welcoming to others. Jesus says, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? 
And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And then it says, the king will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. I hope you see the implications of this powerful passage from Matthew 25, verses 35 through 40. You see, Jesus teaches that the church of Jesus Christ has been designed to be the one place on earth where we know that we will be accepted, welcomed even, even encouraged along life's journey, no matter where it happens to take us. You know, it is in the church that our needs are met. Our desires are fulfilled, and our spiritual longings are met with words and deeds that match the commitment we have made to Jesus Christ. Or, let me be honest, at least that's the way it should be. And you know, it can be that way if we will each take this admonition, these teachings from Jesus' words, as well as his example, very seriously. In fact, here's an invitation to you, beloved. It's time to drop the pretense and start becoming the person who welcomes his or her brothers or sisters with open arms. Jesus says that when we do this to the least of these, it is as if we are doing it for him. This is a powerful invitation and one that I issue to you today as you consider the ways in which Jesus is our example. Well, this brings me to the third example I want to account for in our lesson today. It is following Jesus in forgiving. And let me tell you a story to get you thinking about forgiveness. Now, back in the days when everyone used typewriters, now I know that's ancient history now, but let me remind you there was a little thing called whiteout when we did. And whiteout is a chemical that dates back to 1966 when an insurance company clerk named George Klusterhaus teamed up with a guy who waterproofed basements, and he wanted to develop their own correction fluid. And they originally called this concoction they came up with Whiteout WO1 Erasing Liquid. (laughs) Now, you can still buy the product today. It's called Whiteout, and it's exactly like what it sounds like. You can white things out that you've mistakenly written. Now, whiteout isn't perfect. If you made a mistake on the typewriter long ago, you'd have to take the paper out or get it raised up a little bit and then dab it with whiteout and paint over the mistake and then blow on it and let it dry. And after that process, then you could type right over it as if the mistake had never been made. Now, when electric typewriters came along, some genius invented something even better than whiteout. And what they invented is now known as the self-correcting typewriter. Now, of course, wouldn't it have been great if someday down the road somebody invented self-correcting people? Wouldn't it be cool if there could be a self-correcting husband or wife who would say the wrong thing and just back up and say it over again right? You know, you're just like my mother. Oops. (laughs) Let's erase that and start over. And wouldn't it be great if every spouse or friend or parent or child came with self-correcting technology? But of course we know that's silly because the human race isn't self-correcting. In fact, we're often self-destructing if we're honest. But you know, in His grace, God gave us one of His most amazing inventions, what is called the gift of forgiveness. And in a way, this gift of forgiveness is more powerful than whiteout. In fact, at the cross, Jesus not only covered sin, but he also absolves it. He paid the penalty for it. He removed it as far from the east is to the west. And you know, the Bible tells us that we are to forgive each other in the same way Jesus has forgiven each one of us. Listen to these words from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. Paul writes there, he says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. You know, hearing those words from the Apostle Paul, the funny thing about this is that 
we cannot be compelled to forgive another person. What we need is to have the kind of heart that desires to offer forgiveness. You know, we've all seen little children when they are told to apologize to their brother or sister for something they've done wrong. I've seen it in my own family. These little ones begrudgingly say, I'm sorry. But the look on their face doesn't look like they're sorry at all. And you know, if we're honest, we never really grow out of that. Sometimes we are like that in forgiveness, even as adults. We say, I forgive you. But in our hearts, we know we are only going through the motions because we know that is what we ought to do. We need to say, I forgive you, maybe even if we don't. But you know, the longer we walk with Jesus and learn to think like Jesus and adopt Jesus' compassion, the easier it will be to not only offer forgiveness, but to do so with a willing heart. So let me ask you, dear friend, is there someone you need to forgive today? Maybe it's someone in your family or or someone in our church. Perhaps it's a longtime friend. My encouragement to you is do not delay. Offer forgiveness to them in the same way Jesus has offered forgiveness to you. And let me conclude with this. The reminder that following Jesus, The example of Jesus, it it isn't easy, is it? But I believe it's doable. And how do I know that? It's because God never asks us to do anything that he doesn't give us the ability to accomplish. And of course, he has clearly, as we read God's word, he has asked us to follow the example of his son, Jesus Christ, in our very lives. So rather than focus on what we can't do, Isn't it time we focus on what we can accomplish? What about if right now, at this very moment, we each commit ourselves to following Jesus' examples in the way that we love, in the ways that we welcome, even in the ways that we forgive? You know, those three things alone will be enough to change the course of your life and benefit everyone around you. Let me encourage you as we close the lesson today to start following Jesus' example right now. Thank you for joining me for this new study called It's All About Jesus. And I hope you'll join me again next week as we think about the ways in which Jesus is our example.